I thank uh, Dr. Nivedita, Dr. Divya, and uh, Dr. Smita, who has been here with us to in the management of the so Open Globe, which they have handled. And it's one of the very important topic, especially for the fellows and the senior residents. So most of the emergencies, which all of us have been responsible to take care of these patients, it's like a small journey from the patient when they have first handled by you from the emergency department, which goes through the relevant and the concerned departments and finally ends up as what the case, finally the outcome or what is the surgery we are going to contemplate. So this, this journey involves all the departments, all the consultants, all the fellows and all the postgraduates in, in, in their own space capacities. And we need to be very clear about how do we go about these open globe injuries. And Dr. Ariba and Dr. Path has really prepared well for you to make understand it as simple as possible. She will start with some basic theories which all of us have to know and goes each case by case. Each case has got relevance to the different ways the injury can happen and how is it managed. Okay, So this is uh, one of the very important uh, grand rounds where all the departments are involved. And I thank online all the consultants who have been with us here today. Good evening, everyone. So we'll start this uh, discussion on open globe injury. It's an interdepartmental uh, discussion. So I would request everyone to participate. So open globe injury, whenever there is a full thickness defect in the eye wall, we define it as an open globe injury. And the global incidence ranges from 3.5 per 1 lakh person per year. And in India, incidence is 4.5 to 7.5. The most common cause of ocular injury in the rural population is occupational. And non-occupational includes post-related or RTA. So this is the Birmingham Eye Trauma Terminology, and this was given to uh, clearly understand what is the mode of injury. So we have an open globe injury and a closed globe injury. We are restricting ourselves to open globe injury today. So when there is an increased pressure within the eye and it gives way to the eye wall, uh, then it is called globe rupture. When there is a full thickness wound by a direct injury from a sharp object, it is called laceration. It is uh, again further pictorially depicted by this diagram. As we can see, this is open glow. Whenever there is an increased pressure and there is defect, it is called rupture. When there is a direct impact by a sharp object, it is laceration. It can be penetrating when only entry wound is present. It can be perforating when both entry and exit wound is present. And it is intraocular foreign body when the entry wound is there and there is a retained intraocular foreign body. Coming on to this classification for uh, better understanding, we have graded this at type of injury, the grade of uh, severity based on visual acuity, pupil, and zone of involvement. So type can be, as we have seen in the bed classification, grade ranging on the visual acuity less than 20 by 40, 20, 50 to 20, 100, 19 by 100 to 5 by 200, 4 by 200 to light perception, and last is no light perception. Pupil can be presence and absence of RAPD, that is relative afferent pupillary defect, and zone can be divided into three. Zone one, restricting to uh, up to corneoscleral limbus. Then zone two is from limbus to 5 mm into the sclera, and zone three is beyond 5 mm into the sclera. So this is the ocular trauma score, which was given to tell the prognosis of the injury. So initially, uh, since visual acuity is a very important factor, so we have given scoring based on the visual acuity. And then each and every element uh, in like globe rupture and of thelmitis, which will cause decrease in the visual prognosis, these scores will be deducted from the visual acuity raw score to get the final score. So based on the final score, we have uh, this notion that the higher the OTS score, the more favorable will be the prognosis. So like we see, when the score is 0 to 44, the chances of no light perception is 73%. But when we have a score uh, up to 100, then we have a visual acuity more than 20 by 40, 92% uh, cases. Uh, then initial evaluation, which is very important because we as fellows and SRs posted in emergency uh, department emergency uh, should be knowing the initial evaluation for patient benefit. And uh, we'll start with the history taking with the patient, but the person is well oriented. We'll ask from the patient only. Otherwise, we can ask from the accompanying relative or a bystander who has taken the patient to emergency. 
demographic data that is age, sex, and uh, other relevant details. Then traumatic object will tell us the type of injury, if it's a sharp object or blunt uh, object. Then trauma setting, when the trauma happened, whether it is a road traffic accident or it is a um, like struck by a foreign body. Then past ocular surgery, characteristic of the injury, again, the type of injury it will include. Then past ocular surgical history is important because even there is a recently uh, some uh, in, uh, surgeries like uh, LASIK surgery or radial keratotomy, then that will predispose those areas of weakness and it will give way and causing rupture of the globe. Then um, we'll take the history of uh, safety glasses at the time of injury. Then allergies, anticoagulant, and antiplatelet engine to plan for surgical repair. This history is important. Then systemic illness, bleeding disorder, again, for the surgical planning or further management. Then use of contact lens, high power will indicate whether a person has history of myopia. Then immunization status is important. That is a uh, tetanus toxoid status. Uh, if not given, then prophylactically it should be given. Time of last ingestion, because again, for uh, surgical planning under general anesthesia, we know nil peroral status. Systemic evaluation, the first and foremost thing we should be very uh, sure about, there is no systemic damage, there is no life-threatening damage to the person. So before going for the eye, we should go for the person's life. So any life-threatening injury should be ruled out, and especially the head trauma, the blunt trauma to the chest and abdomen. And uh, again, medical fitness for the anesthesia and surgery should be obtained. For clinical evaluation, we'll see visual acuity, which is very important, and pupillary examination, we are mainly focused on relative afferent pupillary defect. Other than that, if there is a peaking pupil, or uh, these might indicate our occult tear. Then ocular motility will be uh, telling us about the nerve involvement without uh, also on the muscle entrapment. Then external and ocular retinal examination for associated injuries. And when there is an absence of RAPD, then it is a, a strong predictor of a good visual outcome. Slit lamp eye microscopy, uh, we have to make sure that we do not di exert direct pressure on the eyeball because it might hamper, uh, it might also uh, worsen the course of uh, disease. And uh, we should always apply the pressure against the orbital rim. Then subconjunctival hemorrhage, we have to look for the margin, any presence of any occult rupture. If it is very disproportionate to the amount of impact, it might uh, clue, give, us, give us a clue of uh, any occult tear. Then uh, extent of injury, again, zones, we'll see. Then anterior chamber, any hypopion, any hyphema, like uh, iris tears or dialysis or any redia uh, will also indicate uh, any occult tear peaking pupil will indicate that. Lens status, whether it is in the pupillary plane, whether uh, it is dislocated, subluxated, these status we have to know. Then uh, this is the pictorial uh, collection of all the images. Just by pen light examination, we can uh, get a lot of information. Like in the first picture, it is a fish hook, retained fish hook. In the second picture, that is B, it is a Seidel's positive test. Then uh, in uh, third picture, it is showing uh, the expulsion of the intraocular content. This D is showing vitreous tag leaking out. Then E is uh, lens material is extruded out. Then F is showing, like what I have earlier mentioned, it is a subconjunctival hemorrhage, uh, 360 degree subconjunctival hemorrhage might be a possibility of occult tear here. Then G is showing the deformed AC. Again, H is showing the loss of uh, scleral contour, corneal contour is a disorganized flow. Then I is showing peaking pupil here, if you carefully see. Then uh, J is showing displaced lens in this area. So intraocular pressure is again uh, measuring uh, intraocular pressure is contraindicated in open globe because it will cause more harm than benefit. Dilated fundoscopy, whenever at the earliest opportunity, we should be uh, looking for the fundus, uh, but only after the angle status and uh, RAPD is ruled out. The presence of a wound, when you are confirmed that there is a presence of wound, the type of injury, the zone of injury, then it should be, the evaluation should be stopped because the finer details can be uh, uh, sought for on the OT table uh, when the patient is taken for primary repair. So, yeah. so moving on to the imaging part in cases of trauma, the two important imaging modalities include CT scan and ultrasound B scan. Uh, CT imaging, uh, thin axial and coronal cuts, about 0.5 to 2 millimeters of cuts are usually recommended. Uh, it has got a good uh, specificity and moderate sensitivity in detection of open globe injuries. Uh, it's useful in detection of orbital fractures, orbital foreign bodies, and intraocular foreign bodies. Radio opaque foreign bodies are uh, reliably detected on uh, CT scan. Uh, they may even resemble uh, scleral plaque uh, calcifications. Abnormal globe contours are defined in literature, and they have been given various nomenclature like flat tire, mushroom sign, uh, 
uh, discontinuous uh, sclera. Vitreous hemorrhage uh, increases the attenuation of vitreous and can uh, appear as layering, which can mimic uh, thickened sclera. Uh, intraocular air is also a good predictor of open globe injury. Uh, these are four images uh, showing uh, various uh, CT scans in cases of trauma. Image A, as you can see, is a case of a right eye penetrating globe injury. You can see that this globe is deformed as compared to the one on the, uh, the, the right eye globe is deformed and it's uh, colloquially known as a mushroom sign. As you can see here, there's a hypoechoic space which indicates an intraconal air. Uh, image B shows a uh, uh, sagittal image of the left eye, which is showing uh, multiple layers of attenuation, which shows a layered vitreous hemorrhage. Uh, image C shows the presence of a metallic foreign body uh, in the left eye. And image D shows difference in the anterior chamber depth in, uh, in cases of uh, penetrating injury. The intact eye has got about an anterior chamber depth of 3.3 millimeters. Whereas the uh, eye which has under, had a penetrating injury has got a depth of 2.2 millimeters. Ultrasound can provide some advantages like the direct visualization of the ocular coats. It is better over CT imaging. Uh, can be done gently in cases of uh, occult uh, rupture and scleral tear and uh, may be attempted to rule out intraocular foreign body in case CT imaging is not available. A sterile and gentle ultrasound done carefully can give a clue before proceeding for further intervention. Uh, it has high sensitivity and specificity, especially when it comes to ocular coats and detecting retinal detachments, uh, subretinal hemorrhage, as well as hemorrhagic coral detachments. Uh, these are generally indications of poor prognosis and also indicate the severity of injury. Uh, ultrasound is also a good modality for serial imaging done in cases of trauma uh, to manage complicated cases. Uh, in all, uh, ultrasound can be the most important imaging tool to predict visual outcome in an open globe injury. Uh, in tegaderm, uh, a patch can be used. So in uh, cases of open globe injury, uh, copious ultrasound gel can be applied over the closed eye with tegaderm to create an acoustic window. And it uh, prevents any pressure from being applied on the eye in cases of open globe, but it should be done very judiciously and carefully. What is the urgency in managing these cases of trauma? So the main important purpose is to reduce the risk of further uh, damage to the eyeball, to reduce the risk of endophthalmitis, to reduce the victim and the family's psychological trauma, as well as it has got medical legal implications. Now, initial management. Uh, once we are done with the evaluation and imaging, the, which is required at the moment, we'll move with the surgical planning and management. Now, uh, pre-operative management, it should, the person should be nil per oral. General anesthesia is the preferred anesthesia of choice. And we have to keep in mind that we should not uh, advise any topical uh, for an open globe injury. Any protruding foreign body should be retained because it will be acting as a tamponade and can be removed later in the OT. Hard eye shield should be applied to avoid further damage. Tetanus immunization, if not given, prophylactically should be given. Immediate empiric systemic antibody should be administered and also systemic analgesic and anti emetic should be added. What for antibiotic prophylaxis, we'll be giving broad spectrum IV antibiotic like vancomycin, septazidine for gram positive and gram negative bacteria. Then fluoroquinolones can be given uh, when there is a penicillin allergic patient. And for pediatric cases, it should be given in consultation with the, a pediatrician and anesthetist. Consent and counseling is the most important part because we are dealing with a very sensitive, sensitive matter of open globe injury. So informing the patient, the family members about the status of the eye, the surgical plan, the cost and its complications is very important. And we have to inform them that this is the primary repair is the first step towards the uh, management and he might, the person might need multiple surgeries after that. Guarded prognosis before the surgery should be clearly explained so that they might not, uh, they have a reasonable ex expectations after the surgery. For anesthetist role uh, comes uh, because the person is to be taken for management immediately. So indications of general anesthesia is the preferred anesthesia. Indications is whenever corneal laceration with uveal prolapse or significant scleral extension is noticed, when there is a late presentation, a contaminated wound, significant corneal edema, there is extensive corneal rupture with auto expulsion of the content and one-eyed patient, uh, this is preferred. Uh, and for planning for general anesthesia, again, the associated systemic injuries should be looked for. The patient might need a chest X-ray and CT scan when there is a head trauma or a LH history of a blunt head, head trauma or chest trauma. And uh, the, he may also require specialist opinion 
there is a strict control of vital signs should be done. If the patient is diabetic, then we have to keep in mind about the blood sugar levels and how to control. And difficult airways, then uh, the uh, extra staff, manpower, and fiber optic devices should be kept uh, ready for the uh, management. Then, when the what are the advantages? Some cases can be taken up for regional anesthesia, and uh, some of the cases can be when there is a cooperative adult, when there is a very small anterior wound, and when there when the person is a glo open globe injury patient, uh, but it is not NPO. When there is a potential, when there are potential airways issues, and GA cannot be induced. Medically unfit patient when uh, 24 hour on site anesthesia is not available, uh, and the advantages can be it gives good post op analgesia, uh, less post operative nausea and vomiting and less rub and squeezing during uh, recovery. So what is the aim of the primary repair? We wanted a water uh, tight wound closure. We want to establish, re-establish normal anatomical ocular relationship. The wound edges, uh, the aim should be to clean the wound edges of all the external and internal uh, material. And uh, it is to avoid the risk of end of thalmitis and ex uh, expulsive hemorrhage. So all wounds should be closed as soon as possible. And the recommended time is 12 to 24 hours. With this, we'll proceed with uh, case one. This case one is an eight-year-old male child. And uh, right eye was involved. The mode of injury was, was with a glass piece. Uh, it was a lamellar tear in, uh, involving the zone one, as we can see in zone one injury. And it is a lamellar corneal tear. The sebal uh, test was negative. There was no intraocular foreign body, and there's no sign of infection. And uh, prior, no in prior investigations or treatment was given. Here we have given injection TT and uh, topical antibiotic because the sedals was negative, and there is there's a lamellar defect only. Now we have an ASOCT uh, picture, which is depicting a corneal tear at three o'clock with no foreign body and the vision in the involved eye is 6 by 18 and the left eye is 6 6 finger tension is okay in both the eyes anterior segment again these findings as we have uh, described uh, is present posterior segment of both the eyes was normal and this child was taken up for primary repair in two hours and uh, this was the repair done uh, interrupted 10 0 nylon sutures were taken over the lamellar tear under general anesthesia these are the post operative slit lamp photos this, uh, this is the post-operative fundus, which is showing uh, that fundus is with the normal limit. At six weeks, the patient uh, vision improved to six by nine. The intraocular pressure was normal. Fundus you know, was normal. The wound was healing. And the three corneal loose sutures were removed under topical anesthesia. And glasses were prescribed uh, after topical antibiotics were also pres prescribed. Then coming on to the case two, uh, He's also an eight-year-old male child. The left eye is involved, and mode of injury was the plastic pipe his hit uh, hit his own glasses, and that glass piece uh, has hit the eye. So it is a penetrating injury because the piece has fallen out. The zone again is uh, zone one, and uh, he presented to us three hours after the injury. There was associated lid laceration. There was no prior investigation or treatment given. Initially, we have given injection TT, uh, placed an eye shield. And we have uh, started with systemic antibiotic. Like this is the wound. It was the picture taken by the cornea department, and uh, it uh, it was it is showing a full thickness uh, defect in the cornea, a cornea, a cornea, and at lim involving limbus, uh, also with the incarceration of the uveal tissue. And uh, there is associated lid laceration, but it is not shown in this picture. The vision in the involved eye is six eighteen. The posterior segment appears to be normal, and. Um, the child was taken up primary repair, that is corneal repair with lid repair under general anesthesia in two hours of presentation. And intraoperatively, the corneal sutures were given and it will extend to 1 mm into the sclera. Uh, corneal, corneal sutures taken to secure the wound with 9-0 nylon. One scleral suture is also taken. And lid laceration, uh, again, uh, two, lid, two small uh, sutures were taken uh, for the lid. So this is the picture depicting the uh, repair of the primary tear. Then this is the post-operative uh, slit lamp photos uh, showing the repaired con uh, corneal and uh, scleral uh, wound site. Then these are the two lid laceration that was uh, sutured. Small extension into the sclera can be seen in this picture. Post-operatively, the patient was and the uh, ultrasound done post-primary uh, uh, repair show norm, showing normal study. Post-operatively, topical and oral antibiotic, topical steroids, and cycloplegic was given. On post-op day one, loose sutures uh, were removed and re-suturing was done. Post-op day two, ultrasound uh, suggested normal study. So follow-up uh, post-op day two. 
sutures were intact, AC formed, CEDL test was negative, child was comfortable, and best corrected visual activity one week post repair was six by nine. So uh, now coming on to this, I would ask uh, request uh, Dr. MDM to kindly share on corneal wound repair. Uh, so I'll just be describing a few uh, pictures. So this uh, picture just shows us uh, the suture technique. Uh, so the sutures have to be taken perpendicular to the uh, tear. Uh, the, and it has to be taken at 90% depth as seen in image B. Uh, so that the two edges of the tear are well opposed. Uh, in, uh, so this picture shows a gap between the sutures, which uh, implies that the sutures are not well opposed. Uh, these are the triangular extensions that you see from the sutures are the compression zones. Uh, so compression zones in, in a longer suture, the compression zones are larger, whereas in shorter bites, they are shorter. So when you place longer sutures next to each other, you can have a, a, a gap, a larger gap between them. Whereas when you place shorter bites, they have to be kept closer together. The compression sutures should overlap, just overlap, so that the entire tear is closed and there is no wound gap such as in this picture. If there is a wound gape, uh, uh, there will obviously be a leak postoperatively. Uh, this picture shows an oblique tear. We take the suture on the, uh, we start taking the suture on the longer side of the tear and uh, oppose the edges with the same Vijay principles. Vijay 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 Vijay. Can you hear me? Vidya here. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, can you describe A, B, C? Because this picture, this picture, when we are not able to see the pointer, what the presenter is showing. Okay. On, if you can describe the yes, ABC, then it, it makes sense to us. Thank you. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, image A shows that uh, the sutures have to be placed perpendicular to the tear. Image D shows that the suture has to be buried uh, inside and not towards the image. The one below image B is the wrong way to oppose the wound uh, as it shows a gap in between the tears. Uh, the one next to that below image C shows that there is a gap in between the compression zones, which shows us that the tear has been sutured in the wrong way. Image E shows a bleak wound uh, and the, the suture has to be taken on the longer side of the wound before suturing. Image F shows a um, well opposed wound where the suture has been buried, same with image G and H. The pictures below E, F, G, and H show the wrong ways to uh, suture the wound. The one below G shows that the suture has been taken 100% depth, which is uh, uh, not required to do uh, because it introduces, uh, introduces an idis of in infection into the eye. Uh, so 90% depth, like the one shown in B, is the perfect way to suture it. Uh, the one below H shows that the suture has uh, is not has not been buried. And the last one is when there are areas where there are thinning, it's uh, in image H, it shows that an extra suture such as a scleral patch graft or corneal patch graft can be placed before suturing so as to make the area more secure. And uh, the one below shows that this is the wrong way to do it. This uh, picture again shows the compression zones. Elvana, is it okay? Yeah, yeah, perfect, perfect. Thank you. Uh, this picture shows, it again depicts the compression zones that we talked about. Uh, a shows that uh, the gap between the compression zones, uh, which are uh, uh, not the way to go about suturing, uh, any gap between, when, uh, when there's a large gap between the sutures, uh, and if they are shorter sutures in uh, length, then the wound will open up. So the picture on the bottom shows the correct overlap of the compression zones but there should not all there should not uh, be an excessive overlap also because then it can cause excessive scarring and astigmatism i think uh, one small uh, clarification from uh, nivedita and the other cornea departments online uh, when it comes to the lamellar tear so what do you want to suggest to the people of what to do and what not to do and how much time do we have? Do we do the lamellar tear goes in the same urgency as the other cases to do? Yeah, a lamellar tear can also uh, be penit full thickness or uh, partial thickness. Um, and also the size, size of the tear. So if you feel it is CDLs negative, 
it is partial and it is well opposed short diameter you can observe because right from the moment the incident happens the wound healing also kicks in so if you have a wrong set like in this picture the it is a lamellar tear but full thickness but the, if you look at the inner lip there is a disparity step defect if you if you look at the uh, surface there is a bulge so this was Seidel's negative so the question when it came to cornea e it was the day i was there was whether should we suture because it is already well sealed ft is okay and ac is very well formed so then on the slit lamp examination we did find out there was a bump on the surface since the injury was glass and it was a child i suspected it could be a glass piece which we could easily miss in the slit lamp and i thought that could have explained the bulge in the center so we sent the child for asoct when asoct was done the foreign body was ruled out but interestingly the inner lip opposition was not good even though it was a very small wound it becomes very important to realign it because only then the healing will produce a normal contour of the cornea so having said that whenever we deal with suturing the cornea it is also important to keep in mind the contour i don't know whether they have put the patient's uh, final refraction i happen to see it in the yeah I happen to see it in the file the child does have uh, astigmatism so that also we should keep it in mind so opposition proper opposition the contour the depth and how tight you do um, and madhua nicely dealt with the depth and uh, compression suture uh, pressure, pressure zones and uh, she also said how long the uh, sutures should be that is closer in the center and uh, wider in the periphery is all that she has explained but one more important thing is how tight should we do when the when we take up for the suturing based on how much long the child or the patient has passed since the injury there could be variable consistency of the tissue per se depending upon the injury sometimes it can be edematous sometimes it can be really very thin and fragile so the first rule one is never to trim or cut anything that is dangling if it is a badly lacerated the cornea if you can understand it's like a jelly and once there is a gap and the laceration is really bad the gel like a gel like stuff can come up very often we just nicely push it into the um, lips and if you take a nice tight suture you will be amazed to see how beautifully it clears so the edematous cornea which is swollen will look opaque and dirty we might be so tempted to trim it but unfortunately when we do it the next day we will see there is a depressed scar because the, there is a lack of tissue so that is very important so not to cut anything on the cornea and edematous cornea will subside over a period of time so if you take tight enough suture at that point over a period of time very soon it's going to be loose so it becomes important to make it a little tighter a little bit of bunching not too much little bit of bunching is important and uh, burying the suture is very very important very often we see because of not burying the su suture knot lot of complications occur like it can rugged this um, wound position it can cause epithelial defect secondary infection and above all the patient is going to have very symptomatic irritable eye so that also is important where will you bury the suture in a normal this thing um, vertical tear you can bury it anyway any side but nicely deep inside so that it doesn't protrude out when you you have to take it into account the edema so the knot should be slightly below the edema but in a lacerated wound it is always important to keep the knot in the thicker part of the uh, like in the picture e if you see the knot is kept in the thicker portion of the uh, wound because the thinner portion will show an elevation it will not oppose properly it is weak to hold a knot there so it should be on the thicker side anything else you want to ask i think that's a uh, lot of uh, information Nivedita, can i uh, interrupt yes 
so i would respect if, uh, respectfully disagree with the first point that you said about lamellar according to the the bts is uh, thing bgta lamellar is never full thickness because it comes under the closed globe injury maybe if it is full thickness and it is shelved i would call it a shelved wound yeah yeah i meant shelved only can i make a point pratib yeah madam i was just about to ask like other people no yeah. so i think uh, the point that uh, as far as the risk factor goes i think the one thing that she highlighted lasic flap i think the one important thing is also to know whether the child is having a keratoglobus because when you see a patient who is presenting to you, to you especially child please examine the sclera in all patients i think as a routine you must do that because if you see the wound is disproportionately torn comparing to the extent of trauma then one important pointer should be that are we dealing with impact of trauma or are we dealing with a person whose cornea is fragile and thin so one clue would be to look at the other end i would suggest that we do a scleral examination as a cursory examination in most of our patients to pick this up because unlike a normal wound these eyes are very difficult to close and sometimes we may need more than uh, just suturing like glue and other things or even patches to close and even that is difficult because cornea is very thin and taking bites will be very difficult and in these cases we must remember that management of the other eye after this eye is taken care of is equally important like ask them to avoid trauma or if the cornea is very thin other modalities of management should be considered the second point i want to make is about the depth almost always we do 90% but like in a shell wound it sometimes becomes difficult to make 90% so in a normal vertically clean cut if you do your bite is perpendicular horizontal and again perpendicular that's how you are supposed to take the bite so in these eyes the wound opposition is very good at 90% depth in a vertical clean wound where there is no loss of tissue but if you have a shelving wound then it becomes difficult to take it at 90% this may be one instance where a 100% depth is recommended despite the risk of other things that nivedita has suggested here your epithelial epithelial and endothelial the, the way you take the bite should be equidistant from the epithelial side and the endothelial side so you may have more epithelium on one side and less endothelium on the same side when you come out it will be more endothelium on one side and less epithelium on the other side it becomes almost like a box kind of suture so that the wound compression is reasonably tight and i think also about the throws you actually generally what is recommended is that the first throw is perpendicular it is 3 knots second throw is parallel and the third throw is again perpendicular so it will be 3 1 1 the last point i want to make i don't know if you're discussing these things in the subsequent slides is about the iris incarceration uh, so in these eyes i think it's very important to know what is the modality of trauma what was the agent that caused it when you're actually examining it are you looking at a fresh iris prolapse is the surface epithelized is there any evidence of infection because what is recommended is that if you don't see these two signs and if you see the patient within 48 hours and definitely you must be sure there is no infection then you can actually put the iris back and secure the wound on the other hand even if it is less than 48 hours but you see frank infection or you see early epithelization of the surface for the risk of epithelial ingrowth you don't want to put this tissue inside you have to abscess it and send it for microbiological evaluation i just thought i'll add these points i think it's quite a relevant uh, problem points madam thank you i think uh, mpv madam you wanted to say something yeah yeah a nice presentation i just had a question on the uh, one of the cases ariba presented where the uh, Resuturing was done on day one post-op. So, Rama, maybe your opinion on how early to resuture a wound and what are the reasons for resuturing so early? So, I think it depends on a case-to-case -case basis. I would probably only highlight the common ones. One uh, is, I think, if the wound is a very macerated wound, where you really cannot get a good opposition in the primary visit. two if it is a very edematous where again the opposition with significant loss of tissue that is where you have these issues because you don't know how much to tighten or how much to at what tightness should you keep the suture and third i already said in very uh, in globes where the cornea tears like for keratoglobus these are the eyes where you or if the wound is not been sutured properly um, because of technical problems then i think these are the conditions where you may have early loosening of the suture So I think if the wound opposition is not good and you're seeing the patient early enough, 
and you have to take the patient up for other procedures irrespective of whether you take the patient up for other procedures especially in children i think early post op it's always better to replace the wound of the correct tightness but if it is if you seeing the patient after a month and you see the early scarring that is already started and the wound is reasonably stable cedals is negative ac is well formed and you want to intervene in this patient for a retina intervention or a glob or some other intervention then you can decide on table if the wound opens up then you may want to take a bite or if it remains stable at the end of surgery if you think for want of good opposition or for want of symmetry in the cornea or lesser astigmatic medicine then you may want to consider removing the tight ones or the loose ones and replacing it i hope i've answered your question yeah i'm just looking at the screen right now looking at the left side image with the you know well dilated pupil everything looks clear so mm -hmm. because of that picture i just wanted to know whether how mm -hmm. early one should uh, go in again because again it means ga right probably the the photo was not on first so that was pod1 okay mbb ma'am i can answer this question for you this was actually post the second uh, suturing uh the first oh, okay fine he was okay the second uh, post stop day actually the uh, few sutures were, lo were loose and there was uh, cedals was positive and the ac was a bit shallow so that is why we had to take him up for the oh, okay. suture thing this was sure. the oh, sure. okay and uh, just one more suggestion looking at this slit lamp photo uh, maybe an attempt can be made to see the fundus at this stage because it looks like everything will be quite clear so mm, you get yeah, a much thanks. better picture Yeah. Yeah. Doctor RRS. Yeah. Regarding the first case in the lacerated wound, where you can manage uh, uh, without any suture, is if the wound is less than two mm, and it is uh, the thickness of the wound is uh, less than twenty five percent, and it is away from the visual axis, you can manage because this may not induce that much of astigmatism. So these cases we need to see, and uh, uh, we have to put a bandage contact lens. Uh, so that uh, the uh, at least the opposition occurs well even if there is a little bit of uh, uh, loose thinning between the edges thank you and children sometimes it is said that you know depends of course on the case like what sudhir said it's all peripheral small and then superficial yes but if you have more than um, half the thickness of shelving wound in a child then because you are worried that you know child can rub or other things can happen sometimes it is recommended that in children you may want to prophylactically take a bite of thank you uh, any other cornea consultants would like to sir radhika here can i say something yeah yes ma'am yeah hi so yeah, i think uh, among uh, all of you have covered most of the points regarding the lamella tear is one extra point uh, that i use as a guideline is um, even if the wound is small even in your patient if you can go back and see that uh, uh, picture the displacement of the superficial flap from the base lamellar implies that there is a bed and there is a superficial flap no the clinical picture so the displacement of the uh, flap from the bed would be an important deciding factor if you see the first picture for such a small wound the flap is lifted it's not a slit picture there but we can make out that the flap is lifted a little bit so even in a small wound the moment the flap gets lifted the cornea there loses its nutrition this flap is vulnerable for uh, necrosis so in, an intact opposed flap is different from a lifted flap given the same size of the lamella tear so this is the kind of uh, wound even small needs uh, suture thank you madam i think lv madam raise her hand uh, yeah uh, i see the primary repair is the most crucial thing for the final outcome so the whoever is uh, tackling it especially in the middle of the night when senior residents are non cornea people handle the case any uh, tips because we, we when we, when we used to do the procedures in the past we were asked when you have a sclerocarneal wound where to start how to proceed uh, further suturing without uh, ending in complications We do have. Uh, I think Madhu has. Uh, Madhu, you have those slides. That, uh, okay, if it's the... coming up, it's fine. Yes, Because uh, we were we, we were told you just don't disturb the wound. Keep suturing from one end to the post anterior to posterior and things like that. If it's coming I up, think, it's fine. yeah, there is one more slide which yeah, goes on with the second. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, the the take home message will be three points of all the discussion. One is that. 
if you have an iris abscission, don't hesitate to do it, but don't do inadvertently if there is not required. Second thing, other eye examine to be careful with any other corneal abnormality or anomalies over the, in the midnight, you should not land up with a leaky wound for the whole night. Okay. And uh, I think if uh, the cornea things are little clearer, you won't, yeah, for us or for the cornea. Ma'am, we were discussing that first case, the lamella corneal tear. Do you recommend doing an ASOCT for all the lamella tears? Because only after the ASOCT we found out that the inner lip there was a disparity. So no, no. In this particular case, it was a child. Yeah. The, it was injury with the glass, and there is a surface bump. So I basically suspected an uh, foreign, foreign body glass. You may miss in an edematous cornea. So that was the purpose. So if there was no bump, it was well opposed. If it was smaller, then we don't have to do. OK? But always it is better to do an extra thing when you have a suspicion of it. Uh, um, uh, among the presentation, a few points that I wanted to add. It need not be a fresh, uh, recently operated patient. Even if they got operated long back, it is still the surgical wound that will open up. So always the surgical wound is a weak spot. Second, sometimes the patient may be PL negative because he is uh, you know, so distraught or there's so much of hyphema, he is not cooperating. You may not be able to elicit a PL, but that is not a reason to delay or uh, you know, postpone the intervention, especially in fresh wounds. And uh, one thing is uh, a streak hyphema, a streak of uh, heme in the anterior chamber in an apparently intact globe can be a sign of an occult uh, rupture. She mentioned other things, but uh, this she did. I wanted to stress. And uh, one of the things mentioned was that, uh, no, you have to do gonioscopy and all that, but that is never done in the, till the hyphema results, because the act of doing a gonioscopy itself is going to precipitate a, a fresh bleed. And uh, whether there is angle recession or not, it is in no way going to affect our uh, final management, even in our uh, uh, blunt traumas. So the angle recession uh, can be always assessed later once the patient has completely settled. And uh, one of the things that you told about guarded visual prognosis and uh, something else also uh, as a consent. But one thing that you have to specifically stress is infection because we do not know what object went in and how much was the level of contamination. Even if the globe is closed, after that, remember to tell the patients that we have done it, we have cleaned everything. But if the germs have gone into the eye, there is always a risk that the infection can come back again after some days also, because we do not know the nature of the organism. And coming to suturing, one of the things that I want to add, I would request each anterior segment uh, person to practice suturing in the wet lab and learn to rotate the needle to do their cataract surgeries when they are operating in JCOC because invariably there is either pressure with the uh, peers behind the needle so that the needle emerges. Unless you can hit the co cornea perpendicular with the needle and rotate the needle to get it out, you can even open up a semi-sealed uh, globe. So your rotation has to be perfected when you are planning to take up the uh, open globe injuries. When you rotate that, you will find that even without any pressure, your needle emerges on the other side and you can always fold it and take it out. And the cord length, uh, the longer the cord length, more is the compression zone. Yes, right. But at the same time, when you keep increasing the cord length, when you're tightening it, the cornea is a curved structure, your suture is a straight line. So it will uh, tend to pout your lips. So you shouldn't take the, what she told is very clear center you know, is shorter and as you go towards the periphery longer but don't think that if you take longer bites it's going to be easier and lesser astigmatism or anything because you can still cause it to pout and all this applies when like you saw in her diagram the sutures are equidistant on either side of the cut so if the suture gets displaced one shot and the other limb longer then your compression zone itself shifts beyond your laceration that is one of the reasons why you will have post-operative gape and leak, even though you have taken adequate sutures. And at the end, check for a dry uh, wound without visco, without air bubble. If without them, the wound is dry, generally you do not have a leak, you know, very early post-operative period. And vitreous is one thing that looks just like mucus, that is for the PGs. So we where you presume every mucus that is stuck to a wound is vitreous unless proved otherwise. So go ready with the vana scissors 
so when you touch it and if you see one uh, mu- similarly even in emergency when you see one rope ropey mucus thread you know which is is already out so there is no more debate needed in that go ready with a vana so that you cut it and not drag the vitreous out thank you thank you ma'am i think uh, we are just in one third of the presentation two thirds are still more and then we'll go further the cases are getting little tougher the simple cases are over and we go to the next level of the problems what we encountered after the primary repair yeah part coming to the role of vitro retina department in the management of open globe injuries the three most important questions to be answered are what to do when to do and how to do the first two questions will be addressed in this lecture the how to do part will be in the class next week so this is a flow chart which shows a tentative decision making in uh, management of a severely injured eye first is most important thing is to determine whether the uh, globe is anatomically salvageable or not uh, primary enucleation should be considered in cases of non salvageable eyes if the eyeball is anatomically salvageable and there is a risk of end of thalamitis and development of further infection with or without a foreign body then primary vitrectomy should be con- uh, considered as a combined procedure with primary globe repair another factor to consider is the infrastructure and surgeon expertise in management of these cases if both these issues are addressed a primary vitrectomy may be considered uh, when to do so in cases of impending ophthalmitis pre uh, pre existing end of thalmitis intraocular foreign bodies are absolute indications of a primary vitro retina intervention for a comprehensive reconstruction advantages are that risk of end of thalmitis is reduced tissue with uh, irreversible damage can be reduced with uh, less of inflammation it also decreases the risk of uh, proliferative vitro retinopathy and secondary ciliary body destruction a pars planar vitrectomy with tamponading agents is the preferred uh, surgical primary technique uh, this is a table which elaborates additional factors to consider regarding the timing of reconstruction in a severely injured eye the risk of endophthalmitis is maximum in cases of uh, injury with an intraocular foreign body perforating injuries are um, uh, more at risk of developing uh, pvr changes subsequently longer wounds need uh, early reconstructive surgery because of risk of hemorrhage as well as damage potential to the retina unsutured uh, two posterior wounds generally can be observed uh, can we can get away with some delay but uh, during vitrectomy the iop should be controlled at that time in cases of end of thalmitis where cornea prevents adequate visualization a temporary keratoprosthesis uh, should be used if no graft is available uh, during that moment unless the iris has been verifiably expulsed uh, for example in cases of severe anterior uh, segment trauma uh, it is uh, uh, better to retain as much of iris as you can if the iris is not uh, infected in children uh, lens swelling can occur uh, within hours and with that can lead to a pupillary block and sec- se- uh, severe secondary glaucoma so early lens uh, removal can be advocated in children if vitreous hemorrhage is more severe early intervention is uh, considered uh, direct trauma that is a uh, deep wound uh, Uh, over the posterior sclera posterior exit wound and iofps require early surgery to prevent retinal detachment in cases of retinal incarceration to develop uh, to prevent the formation of a closed funnel rd early surgery may be recommended uh, the lower the iop uh, the more is the chances of secondary ciliary body damage and consequent thysis hence a primary repair should be done as soon as possible so when to go for a, a stage three uh, stage approach uh, in cases of inexperienced surgeon or odd hours ability or uh, during night time or something or lack of trained staff improper instrumentation we can uh, uh, try and do only a primary group uh, repair uh, either there is a risk of uh, intraoperative expulsive hemorrhage a large and a posterior scleral wound uh, uh, can be considered to be delayly uh, delayedly repaired a large supracorneal hemorrhage which is already uh, uh, clotted uh, can be waited for clot lysis to occur after starting steroids Uh, arguments in favor of a second stage approach is that the cornea may relatively become clear because of resolution of inflammation you already have a watertight wound after primary repair and uh, there is, might be a possibility of pvd induction uh, about uh, uh, one week after the initial insult so the stage approach has been described as early delayed and late an early intervention within 4 days offers an advantage of comprehensive surgery with one major exception that it does not prevent the occurrence of endophthalmitis there is a controlled risk of expulsive choroidal hemorrhage uh, provided rigorous uh, topical cortical ther- uh, therapy has been initiated uh, second option is delayed vitrectomy uh, it does not um, serve any purpose because benefits of early surgery fade out and it does not decrease the risk of hemorrhage late surgery that is surgery after one week uh, to two weeks uh, is considered in cases of retinal detachment uh, pvr changes but post operative complication risk are still present
uh there are some studies that was done uh, one study by nashed at all involved primary wound repair with vitrectomy and silicone oil injection uh, in cases of open globe injuries with uh, retinal detachment within 8 hours of presentation they had done this study in about 88 patients so the results of this study showed that few patients had uh, retained re about reading vision well as 50% of the patients that retained ambulatory vision and final visual outcome is determined by the severity of injury so this uh, intervention with silicon oil reduces the risk of post operative end of cell mitis and advanced pvr development with respect to comparing the impact of surgical timing with anatomical and functional outcomes of early vitrectomy that is considered uh, less than 4 days versus delayed onset that is between 10 to 14 days group another study found that better visual uh, better retinal reattachment rates were seen in cases where early vitrectomy was done in uh, less than 4 days Although no statistically differ, uh, significant difference was found in the rate of post-operative complications. Other studies also recommend early vitrectomy in cases of severely injured eyes. Most of these uh, uh, studies in literature uh, recommend a duration of about uh, intervening between 3 to 4 days. Now proceeding further with the case 3. These cases are managed uh, both uh, by cornea department, glaucoma department and retina department. And these are the cases that dealt with early and delayed approach. The late surgeries that is done beyond 14 days of presentation. We are not dealing those cases. Case 3 is a 50 year old male. Uh, right eye was involved. The mode of injury was with the iron particle. It was a penetrating injury to the zone 1. And 9 hours after the injury he presented to us, there was an associated right side cheek injury and lid injury. No prior investigation was done, but they have given eye drop uh, topical antibiotic and they have referred to higher center. Now, as we have emphasized earlier, that uh, topical antibiotic should not be given to an open globe injury. So this was a malpractice that we noticed. An initial treatment, we have given systemic antibiotic. This was a, a slit lamp photo uh, just before the primary repair. And the pa patient uh, presented with a vision of hand movement in the involved eye. The anterior segment is showing the full thickness corneoscleral tear uh, extending from 10 o'clock to around 3 o'clock. And there is also hyphema noticed uh, and along with the superior iridodialysis, which is not clear in this picture. The lens detail is, was also not clear, but there was no evidence of uh, hypopion. Though there were a uh, few eyelashes that uh, was uh, raising the uh, question of uh, IOFB, but then later we discovered that they were eyelashes, and in the left eye, the vision was 6-6, though the pressure was surprisingly uh, high, it was 26. The anterior segment of the other eye was normal, and uh, uh, posterior segment of the other eye was showing an advanced cupping of 0.7, but there was no um, difference in the superior and inner rim. So the uh, SR and uh, senior resident and consultant was informed and injection. Can I just was... make a comment? Uh, Point seven. How can you say advanced cupping when the inferior rim is equal to superior? Uh, yes, ma'am. Point seven and inferior rim is equal to superior. Yes, ma'am. We cannot comment because the other eye status is also known, not known. Uh, it should be a disparity of uh, CDR between two eyes. So we cannot say that. Uh, and also there is no uh, disparity in the rim thinning. So we cannot say it can be normal for a person. So we have uh, injection T was given, eye shield was applied, and anesthetist on call was informed. And uh, uh, the person was having bilateral pedal edema, and there was T wave inversion. But under high risk con consent, it was taken because it was a full thickness uh, corneoscleral tear. And repair, primary repair was done two hours after presentation. And uh, corneoscleral tear repair and eyelashes were removed, and lid tear was done under uh, general anesthesia. Intracameral septazidine dexamethasone wash was given and it was also given subconjunctival because the, uh, of the presence of lash that we encountered. Postoperatively, the patient was started on topical and IV antibiotics, topical steroids, lubricant, cycloplegics, and oral analgesics. Oral steroids uh, uh, to be given, planned for uh, to be given after physician clearance. Post-op day one, since uh, we uh, were suspecting uh, some cardiology uh, cardiologist uh, opinion, so we have taken uh, ECG and ECO, but it turned out to be normal. USG B scan is showing a uh, hyperreflective uh, globular shadow, and we have done a serial USG scan on post op day one, three, and eight. It was showing a persistence of that uh, globular shadow, and we were suspecting it as a dislocated uh, lens. Serial USG screening was done, uh, and then day fifth we'll get we get the uh, fitness for oral steroid. We have started oral steroids. Two loose sutures were removed and re-suturing -re was done, as emphasized earlier. Glaucoma clinic opinion we have taken uh, because the intraocular pressure was 32, and uh, they have added eye drop timolol. 
and uh, day five we switch to oral antibiotics these are the uh, again the serial slit lamp photos uh, showing that the wound is uh, well sutured and uh, uh, there is no uh, leak uh, but we can see a small area through this window some cataract is uh, changes in the lens though most part of the lens uh, we cannot com uh, comment um, as we have noticed uh, on the ultrasound, it might be dislocated posteriorly. Uh, so these are the serial photos that we have taken. Uh, CT scan was again done to rule out uh, any foreign body. So no foreign body was uh, present, was not noted. But they have uh, again uh, uh, shown, uh, the CT scan is showing a dislocated lens inside the vitreous cavity. Uh, so the patient was uh, uh, further... Uh, followed up on post op day 12 the iop was uncontrolled and uh, there was a questionable diagnosis of lens induced secondary glaucoma so the person was started on combigan along with torzolamide uh, day 12 because of the uh, in view of uncontrolled intraocular pressure uh, right eye was uh, surgery was taken up that is lensectomy and vitrectomy under local anesthesia this was the intraop uh, drawing and uh, post-op day six post VR surgery re suturing was done in the post-op period because we have noticed on post-op day uh, one we have noticed there's some uvl tissue incarcerated in the wound so we have uh, we were watching this area and uh, we have re-sutured it uh, on day six post VR surgery and we have uh, again uh, after that uh, eye drop combigam and dimox was continuing for three days and uh, on day fifth of the VR surgery the uh, azopt was added so uh, the patient were developed gastritis because of the dimox so patient was discharged after one week uh, with combigan and azopt twice a day and he is yet to follow for the next appointment i would request mdm so doctor what is the cause of glaucoma in this case according to you and we were suspecting there is lens induced inflammation that must have uh, caused uh, raised intraocular pressure but yes we noticed uh, a raised uh, iop in the uh, other eye also uh, before taking up for the primary repair. Uh, so what zone is this? The previous doctor mentioned the zone of uh, injury. So what zone is your patient? Ma'am, this is both zone 1 and up to 5 mm into the, uh, from the limbus to 5 mm, uh, also zone 2. So it is both zone 1 and 2. Zone 1 and 2, no. It is zone 2. How do you actually write uh, trauma classification uh, full uh, in full form? Suppose I haven't seen your case and somebody asks me the prognosis. What are you supposed to write? Yes, ma'am. Zone 2 because it will automatically involving the zone 1. So yeah. zone, two, yeah. zone 2. Then what else will you write? What is the next word you write? After zone 2, what do you write? The type of injury, penetrating, perforating. Is it type A or type B, this one? Okay, type, uh, as we have uh, described in the original classification, ma'am, uh, type of injury will be... Uh... You're presenting a case of trauma. Yes, ma'am. There are two types, perforating and mm -hmm. penetrating. Yes, so, ma'am. So, first you should know classification. No, So, what classification is this? Ma'am, this is OTS classification. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah. So, you don't have to see. You have to tell. You have to diagnose. You have to give the uh, diagnosis for me. Uh, Ma'am, this is a penetrating trauma, so type B. So you write, what all do you write? When you write at the end of the case, because nobody is doing it, no trauma uh, PG, despite the fact that in my files, 60% of the time I write type A, type B, zone 1, zone 2, PL positive, PL negative, intraocular foreign body plus minus, RAPD plus minus. These things have to be mentioned. If you are running, uh, mm -hmm. 20, uh, if you are there 24 hours for trauma, you need to mention this because that is the prognostication. Ten, five years down the line, when you are saying that within six hours patient came, and if you don't write the classification, then how, uh, what is the meaning then? So you should tell that you had a zone 2, PL positive, intraocular foreign body plus minus, RAPD not uh, possible to be checked, type B. Okay, so please learn how to term, how to, to say the terminology of trauma. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Okay. So I'll just be describing a few of the slides that uh, they've put up. 
Uh, so this is the 50% rule technique that is used uh, mainly for uh, scleral wounds. So the first the first suture is taken, if there is a linear wound, the first two suture is taken bisecting the wound uh, so that it is divided into two equal tears. And then uh, you again on, on either side of the uh, suture that you have taken, you again take a suture bisecting the wound. And like that, you complete the entire length of the wound. The these uh, these two pictures. The first one shows if the scleral tear is a little bit more anterior. We open the conjunctiva uh, up. If it's an anterior scleral tear, we open the conjunctiva to um, ex, uh, expose the scleral tear, and then we take starting from the limbus or anteriorly, and we suture the entire scleral tear. Uh, whereas the second the picture below, if it goes more posteriorly, we do something called close as you go technique. So you open the conjunctiva as you suture. It, you keep uh, exposing more of the conjunctiva and uh, suture till what uh, we can see. Uh, even if, uh, because as it goes most, more posterior, we won't be able to visualize the tear very well. So suture as much uh, as we can see. Um, can I, uh, Madhu, I'll interrupt you for a second. Yes, ma'am. Close as you go has a little more to it. So basically, in a scleral wound, it's difficult to visualize the posterior part of the wound. So in order to maximize the visualization, it is not possible to apply traction to the globe in the initial instant because the uh, globe is open. So as and how you put a couple of sutures, you can <coughs> cut the suture ends a little long and use that suture <coughs> and provide gentle traction on it so that more of the sclera below and the wound below gets exposed. So you basically use that uh, 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 as, a, as a pull for you to expose the distal part of the wound and you close. That's what close as you go means. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, one minute. Just go back to your slide. Uh, I have not heard of uh, 70 nylon for sclera. Uh, I'm sorry if that uh, anybody else has used 70 nylon for sclera. I think it's a it's a uh, technical mistake. It's yeah, a, yeah. I think it's a it's a vicryl, right? Yes, ma'am. Here we use uh, 7080 vicryl, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, uh, like LV ma'am had asked before, this is the suturing order. So where do we start suturing from? Uh, the first, uh, each uh, of the image, each of the images tells us the order from which we can start suturing. So the first one is a corneoscleral tear. So we can start always at the limbus because the limbus is, becomes our anatomical landmark. It approximates the edges of our tear. And after that, uh, in the first image A, uh, so uh, we take the first tear, uh, first uh, long uh, and tight bite at the limbus. And as we go, go closer to the cornea, it becomes shorter like we had stated before. Uh, in this case, in, corneus, uh, uh, in the corneus scleral tear, we again use, we can use the 50% rule. The second picture is just a corneal tear involving the limbus. Again, you start at the limbus with a longer tear and as you go closer towards the center, it becomes uh, shorter bites. The third one is a limbus to limbus tear. Uh, we start at the limbus again and go towards the center. Uh, the fourth one, D is uh, a linear scleral tear. Again, the 50% rule, which is described in the previous uh, photo, uh, we take one in the center, bisecting the uh, tear, and then take uh, subsequently uh, the subsequent sutures. The fifth one is a triradiate tear. Uh, so here we treat each limb as a separate tear. So you suture each uh, limb uh, like a linear tear, like how you would suture a linear tear. And once you come to the apex, we can close it with the help of uh, a purse string suture. And uh, this is a scleral tear where we, uh, which is more posterior, uh, which is going more posterior. So we start suturing it anteriorly. And as we go posteriorly, uh, we keep opening up to the conjunctiva till how much ever we can suture. Coming to case four, this was a 27 year old male. The right eye was involved. The mode of injury was with the iron hook. Type was penetrating. It was zone one injury. Uh, he presented 10 days from the injury and there was no associated injury. The prior investigation ultrasound patient carried and it showed uh, shows evidence of uh, a vitreous hemorrhage but no retinal detachment. Prior treatment, he was already a uh, status post corneal tear repair uh, just one day after the injury. And uh, after uh, injury, he was uh, on topical antibiotic and steroids along with cycloplegic. Uh, and we have, as an initial treatment, we continued the topical drops. Now, uh, this was the ultrasound which suggested a blood lined uh, posterior vitreous detachment, vitreous hemorrhage, but the retina was attached. 
sorry yeah this was the anterior segment uh, photo and uh, it is uh, showing uh, in the involved eye the pl was brisk the finger tension was okay corneal tear already uh, repaired but as we see in the slit lamp photo that it is not repaired properly the distance as we have already discussed that the distance between the bone the uh, overlapping edges uh, so it is a very uh, ill prepared ill repaired uh, wound and along with the evidence of hyphema there was uh, some traumatic cataract and cedals was negative uh, there was no hypopion there was no in, uh, intraocular foreign body the other eye had 6 6 vision the pressure was normal anterior segment was normal and uh, okay. we in the involved eye we do not have uh, any view of the posterior uh, uh, segment but in the other eye left eye it was normal so we planned for a uh, vitroretina intervention under cornea backup under general anesthesia and steroid cover and uh, oral steroid was started as per body weight what was the just, main concern in this case? Uh, can you go back to the first slide, the previous slide? On, one second. The, yeah, this um, fish no, hook. Ma, ma, yeah, 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 you can talk. Interrupt you. Since, since, go back to this. Since that wound suturing was not good according to you, I just want Madhu to tell okay, how, this one, yes, yeah. how this could have been sutured better. Uh, I think... Uh, uh, tri radiate suture. So I think first we could have um, the sutures have to be equal in length on uh, both sides and uh, more parallel to the limbus, which they are not. Uh, so look at the lines carefully. It is three line, two small and one very long. You see all the ends. So you tell me which one you will start first and how will you proceed? Take your time, but do it. Once we do it, it's clear. There's no point in. So what are the rules? You see the length. You see how many arrows are pointing. And what are the, is the limbus involved? So here is the limbus involved. It appears to be involved. It appears to be involved. So there you will first check whether the limbus is involved. Your first suture will be at the limbus. The rest of the Ys have any limbal involvement. No, doesn't look, like doesn't look like. So now after securing the limbus, now you have three lines. The longest line is the one which has the limbus involved. Mm -hmm. So that whole length, first, first. Mm -hmm. not first. You will only in the whole length, you bisect, bisect the line. That will be your first suture in that. Mm -hmm. So now the two small arms in that whole length, you will take, you'll bisect and take one. So now what is remaining, again you will take bisecting sutures. So now finally what you will be left will be is the tip apex. Apex you have one uh, arrow and one line. So that is best opposed by a tri triangular suture. So based on how your wound pattern is, it can be circular, it can be triangular, it can be hexagonal. Here it is three lines crisscrossing together form, forming an apex so you will take bites at each of the um, body and it becomes a triangular so then it will be nicely opposed it's a triangle so to create that nice triangle you have to close up all of this only then the tissue will gradually rise, rise up to the apex if you start and put one line how she has put there you are compressing everything you are already distorting and you have not taken a wound in the uh, uh, limbus Limbus should be. So limbus well opposed. Now you have cornea intact. Then you bisect the lines. You bisect them again. In the apex, you see whether it is opposed. Sometimes the apex may not be opposed. It might be overposed or there will be a gape. That means you have not done the suturing. process. There is no harm in taking out and redoing. Get the opposed apex and then close. Okay? Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. We'll move on. Yes, sir. So it was referred to... Uh... Uh, also, we noticed uh, raised uh, pressure, intraocular pressure, uh, 24 mmHg. So we referred to glaucoma department, and uh, eye drop remolol was added. And they all, uh, they have also advised injection mannitol uh, preoperatively, and they advise, uh, they have advised for a post-op moni IOP monitoring. So we have taken this case, uh, lens with lensectomy, vitrectomy, belt buckle endolaser and uh, tamponade with C3F8 under local anesthesia at day 14 uh, from the injury. Like he presented to us already 10 days after the injury. So it is day four of presentation here. We have taken this case and uh, uh, this was the procedure done. But uh, surprisingly, we noticed uh, 
like uh, in ultrasound when we go back in ultrasound there was no evidence of any occult tear or any uh, globe dehiscence noticed uh, so uh, this case emphasizes more on the importance of ultrasonography as a screening to rule out any dehiscence any occult tear which might be missed because later intraoperatively we noticed a uh, uh, occult rupture just below the insertion of superior oblique muscle and uh, first string suture was taken and cryotherapy was done at the site. This was the site of uh, perforation. Then post-op day one, the AT was 26 and uh, tablet Dimox was added thrice a day. Uh, then IUP monitoring was done and he was advised to continue topical anti-glaucoma. Uh, day four, uh, they were following up uh, after every two, three days. So post-op day four, uh, syrup glycerol was given twice a day for three days. Post-op day six, uh, Combigam along with the uh, oral uh, Dimox was given, but the Dimox was tapered to half tap uh, thrice a day. And uh, day 11, again, I dropped Combig and was at, uh, this Dimox was stopped and Dorzox was added till next appointment. Now, next appointment, the uh, patient came at six weeks postoperatively. The AT was, uh, ablination tonometry was again high. It was 34, um, uh, it was now eight weeks from the injury. And uh, the patient was already started on a maximal medical therapy, which involved timolol, brimonidine, dorzolamide, and bimatoprost. And the uh, glaucoma department have taken the decision to go ahead with surgical intervention. And uh, glaucoma drainage device was planned at the earliest. Uh, in the slit lamp photo that was taken six weeks postoperatively, we can, we can see uh, that, and it is uh, the sutures were again uh, this was a revised sutures that we have taken and um, it was uh, then uh, yeah we can notice microcystic uh, edema indicating uh, can be a sign of raised intraocular pressure so the patient uh, post amid glaucoma valve uh, the pressure was under control and patient is yet to follow up at six weeks with uh, six weeks after this uh, um, after this uh, amid glaucoma valve surgery and these this is the six weeks post operative uh, Fundus, uh, which is showing uh, evidence of uh, gas tamponade and uh, uh, very hazy view because of the corneal edema, but we can hazily see the disc, we can see the retinized attached. I think we'll just give this to the, we have Dr. Deep and Dr. Smitha here. So for the glaucoma inputs, I think uh, we need to just give us anything about, particularly about the uh, management of in these periods. So one minute before going on to the glaucoma, this patient had an injury with a hook actually. So that is why there was a penetrating injury and an exit wound which was near the insertion of the superior oblique. So this was actually a perforating injury and not a penetrating injury. It was not picked up on the first examination. Do not suspected also because the IOP was normal. Yes. Also, I just wanted to make that point that fish hook injury means you are supposed to see the lids also. And how you have to ask the history, how it was actually removed. There are associated uh, 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 injuries in a fish hook injury. That's what I just wanted to say. Uh, so usually in uh, penetrating traumas, at presentation, definitely IOP is not an issue. Once the wound is closed, so that time when you have the glo globe has been restored, the uh, the high femur, the inflammation, uh, lens material, if the lens uh, is breached or le le the lens uh, causing particulate, uh, it's like um, uh, leakage from uh, uh, dropped nucleus and all, can cause IOP spike. So uh, initial phase, we would like to manage medically to the maximum so that the globe has healed uh, well and then the later then at later stage the patient can be taken up according to the visual uh, potential and all that but if like in the first case as you saw the iop remained uncontrolled with maximum medication and the patient was unable to uh, tolerate dimox and most probable cause in that case there were a lot of other signs also like high fema iris trauma and a drop nucleus so all this would contribute so uh, if you have an uncontrolled IOP, then uh, you need to go in to take out the uh, inciting agent. The second case, post-operative period was uh, able to manage medically, but when the patient presented at GA visit, that time uh, with maximum medication without uh, estrazolamide, and even with estrazolamide, the pressure remained high. Now the, uh, there is no hyphema, then what is the issue here? 
uh, as you can see that the patient was having aniridia. So aniridia tells you that there was severe trauma to the anterior segment. And uh, as the wound healing has happened, there must be severe fibrosis scarring at the trabecular meshwork. So this patient is not going to respond to medical therapy alone. So as in when what you see the visual potential is and how much is the IOP, based on that, you take the call of uh, going in with the glaucoma surgery. Are there any particular uh, medications you would like to uh, avoid or during these, uh, these inflamed eye or any trauma? Divya? We would uh, avoid prostaglandin analogs in the immediate uh, post-surgical uh, period uh, because of uh, m multiple factors uh, for uh, risk of inflammation. Um, so after two or three weeks, if the IOP remains uncontrolled with other medications, we would uh, add the prostaglandin analog as well next step of management and also i would like to highlight that in the uh, post uh, global prepare phase the intraocular pressure measurement will be a challenge in most cases we would not be able to take a good uh, reliable uh, application measurements also and with the epithelial defect and corneal edema uh, uh, we may not be we will not be able to take a measurement itself so in that situation uh, tonopen would be helpful if in doubt uh, always refer to a glaucoma department for evaluation your choice would be the applanation tonometry yeah, first choice is applanation tonometry yeah. if it's a pure scleral tear or a, a well sutured uh, corneal tear we will take applanation uh, if applanation is not right. possible tonopen it's a very good important uh, information that you need to keep in mind in these post trauma cases where the tonopen is also need to be ready for the evaluation of iop uh, Madam LV, madam, is there anything you want to add, madam? Oh, uh, Pradeep, sorry, I missed it a little bit. So, okay. because I have to attend a call. No problem. Uh, yeah, please ask me what you wanted. Uh, no, they covered uh, the, the difficulties in measurement of the IOP during this uh, post trauma, especially the corneal tear repairs. Mm. And uh, Dr. Smita also uh, mentioned about what are the difficult, what are the, uh, the, the ways the glaucoma that can that can behave and uh, what are the different pathogens is what it can behave. So any other, any points which you would like to add on, madam? Uh, yeah. I, I, I think if she has mentioned about the eye care and digital measurement, that should be fine. So what is important is if it is very high, aim is to bring it down. So remember that a healthy optic now will not go into a major problem if you can just manage the pressure from very high level to even to a moderate level like what you have written here 26 less than 30. so in majority of the times it is transient related to the trauma related to the high femur so once the eye becomes quietened then we can assess and see what exactly is the cause for the problem if the pressure remains high i hope I answered. I'm sorry, I missed a little bit of presentation. So it's uh, it's good, ma'am. LV, ma'am, I have one doubt. Yeah. Uh, some patients uh, in uh, in in patients who come with a uh, high FEMA without trauma, mm. we have a dictum of intervention of AC uh, evacuation of the blood uh, based on criteria like 50 and above for more than 72 hours. 30 mm. and above more than three days. Mm. I'm sorry, I do not know the exact dates, but do they also hold true here that if the pressures are raised and high FEMA is increasing, do we intervene? And uh, uh, because sometimes it's very difficult for me to say the uh, uh, blood staining of the cornea because iris pigments is also missed. Yeah, I think so it I can... depends upon the age of the patient. In a child, the blood staining is chances are very high. You have to be aggressive. In an adult, you can watch closely. But if you see the color of the hyphema changing, like uh, uh, towards the blacker in color, I, I think that is an indication that you have to uh, evacuate. That, that's an eight ball hyphema that you're talking yes. about, ma'am. Yes. Something yes. like that. Yeah. Okay. And also, your rebleed chances are very high if you try to intervene very soon. You have to keep that in mind and then plan the treatment. Um, how long the dimox can be continued for these cases? Yeah, as long as patient is able to tolerate, there is no if there are no contraindications. As long as you want to keep the pressure under control. Good, thank you.
Uh, any other uh, doubts on the glaucoma before we can go on to the next hardcore VR department works? So if there's nothing, I think we can continue. Okay, sir. If the, uh, yeah, I think uh, most of the corneal questions have been answered. I think we can make the corneal consultants uh, also free if they are <laughs> on to. Otherwise, they can be interested to continue also. Thank, Thank you. you ma'am. Yeah. Moving on to the next case, a 19-year-old male presented to us with a vacuum cleaner blast injury one day back. Uh, he had showed locally and was advised corneoscleral tear repair bar evisceration. Patient was started locally on uh, eye ointment catifloxacin, oral analgesics and antibiotics. Uh, we had assessed the patient in emergency uh, there. Initial treatment here was uh, given injection uh, tetanus with injection taxim IV and injection garamycin IV. It is a type zone 1 and zone 2 uh, injury combined together. On presentation, the patient had no perception of light in the right eye. Uh, there is a full thickness corneoscleral tear from 7 o'clock to 11 o'clock with total uh, 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 high fema and a posterior extension with iris tissue prolapse as can be seen in the image. There is no visible foreign body or uh, hypopion and there is no view of the posterior segment. Uh, primary uh, corneoscleral tear repair was done under three hours of uh, presentation under general anesthesia under very guarded visual prognosis. Uh, intraoperatively, uh, the scleral wound was sutured with 8 0 vicral sutures. Corneal wound was repaired with uh, 10 0 nylon sutures. Uh, superior scleral wound was sutured with uh, vicral sutures to the maximum extent possible. Uh, vitreous prolapse was noted from the superior scleral wound, uh, and uh, initial uh, anterior vitrectomy was done. Uh, Postoperatively, the patient was started on topical and oral antibiotics, steroids and cycloplegics, and a physician clearance was sought out for uh, oral steroids. Uh, on postoperative day one, the patient was referred to the vitreoretinal department. Here... Part, part, Dr. Path, can you go back to your slide, please? I yes. just want to say, since PGs are also there, so you showed a wound where it's almost collapsed, almost the intraocular contents are uh, trying to expulse out, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. So what, what examination will you do to know that the uh, extent of the tear is not uh, superior or inferior. What basic examination? Serial test, ma'am. You will never do serial. There's no, if, from my point of view, in any trauma, serials has no role. If uh, AC is flat and intraocular contents are protruding out, yes, the last thing you want is to see serials. Hmm. That is done in dry eye, not here. So extraocular movements, you need to know, Path. So you need to see extraocular movements here. Okay, because you are going in a patient in which there is severe trauma, you are actually not going for corneoscleral tear repair, you are actually going for wound exploration here. I just want to tell that point, that you may have surprises on table, lots of us experience that. So you are actually going in for a wound exploration. Yes, because your extent of trauma does will be under the chemotic conjunctiva, not visible. Okay. Yes, so you need to mention about extraocular movements here. That's all. I just wanted to say this is a very basic point, guys, because I'm many years into uh, for thing not to find any mistakes in you. you do, you're doing a great job. Yeah, continue. Thank you. It might be necessary to take a evisceration consent sometimes in such severely traumatized cases. Uh, uh, I'll differ in that uh, VGP. Evisceration consent is taken only if you plan evisceration, if you're going to do evisceration. Evisceration is a per -op complication which occurs for which you will have to do if there is a supracoroidal hemorrhage, you can take a consent for supracoroidal hemorrhage. But for me, evisceration means I have decided to do evisceration. If it happens, it means you will still wound, close the wound and then tell that it, ha it has happened. You will not, I, I don't believe in taking uh, evisceration consent uh, without uh, uh, knowing very well that it can, supracoroidal hemorrhage can occur. Uh, the post uh, uh, the patient was then subsequently referred to the VR department on post operative day one. Uh, sterile and gentle ultrasound uh, V scan was done. There was no lens echo noted on ultrasound. This uh, vitreous cavity showed plenty of uh, membranous and dot echoes. Uh, there was a um, uh, membranous echo with poor after movements. A possibility of retinal detachment uh, could not be ruled out. Uh, there is diffuse choroidal thickening that is seen on ultrasound. Uh, serial ultrasound uh, imaging done subsequently was indicative of a total retinal detachment. Uh, CT scan uh, showed uh, no evidence of intraocular foreign body, but intraocular hemorrhage was seen. Uh, visual uh, VP was done to evaluate the visual potential of the eye. As you can see, there is markedly delayed uh, P2 latency with uh, reduced amplitude. 
In view of young age of the patient, 19 year old, a trial of surgery was offered uh, with a plan of lensectomy with vitrectomy with membrane peeling with relaxing retinectomy with a PFCL injection, endolaser and silicon oil injection under general anesthesia uh, under very very guarded prognosis. The surgery was done on day 11 of presentation after starting oral steroids. Cornea opinion was taken uh, and the patient was taken up for surgery uh, uh, subsequently. On table, after removal of pupillary membrane and blood clots, a total retinal detachment with the posterior closed funnel configuration was noted with large irregular defects with incarceration seen at the site of wound and choroidal infoldings were also noted superiorly. Uh, in spite of 360 degree relaxing uh, retinotomy, including radial uh, retinotomy near choroidal infolding, uh, the funnel could not be opened up and so further surgical steps were deferred. Uh, why is a globe rupture important? Uh, rupture presents the most severe form of uh, mechanical globe trauma. It uh, comprises about 32% of all open globe injuries. Uh, wound in cases of uh, ruptured globe is uh, rarely located at the point of impact. The site may not be visible in the initial examination. What are the signs of an occult tear? Presence of a thick subconjunctival hemorrhage, a scleral step sign, tissue extrusion of a, or a deflated globe, presence of a circumscribed mass under the conjunctiva can possibly be an expulsed crystalline lens, abnormal anterior chamber depth, peak pupil, and a serial sign positive. Uh, no light per uh, perception does not mean no intervention. Uh, this is because increasing studies have shown that even in eyes with no perception of light, there is a role of explorative vitroretinal surgery with the available instrumentation that is uh, available for us these days. There was a study uh, which was done by Agarwal et al., in which the outcome of surgical repair in severely traumatized eyes with no PL was studied in 27 patients. One third of these patients had ambulatory vision following surgery, whereas two thirds of them remained uh, with no perception of light. Poor indications uh, due, uh, of the outcome of the study were uh, presence of afferent pupillary defect, a vitroretinal insult, and wound extending posterior to rectus insertion. Uh, this is a flowchart which shows uh, evidence based guidelines in a no uh, perception light uh, of uh, eye. So basically, if the eye is not anatomically salvageable, then in in nucleation is recommended. In case where anatomical distortion is possible, primary rep uh, repair along with stage vitrectomy can be done. If uh, subsequently there is chronic intractable pain or the eye goes into thysis or there is a risk of sympathetic uh, ophthalmia, uh, in nucleation can be considered. Yeah, so I agree with the Dr. Uh, MLY that you don't take evisceration consent at all. If you plan evisceration, you do evisceration. That's all. That's your uh, guidelines also show the same thing, right? Yes. Sir. You really never try to uh, eviscerate the eye. It's not necessary. You can close the eye. That's very important. You're basically closing the eye. You're leaving behind tissue so that there is a orbit there inside the eye. And at least it makes the eyeball you know, less painful in future. Okay. And less dis disfigured. So you don't take eviscation consent. Please don't do that. And secondly, Again, okay, okay, one more. I'll just complete my sentence. And as he, there is no role for VEP, okay? There's really no role for VEP in a setting of acute trauma. Please don't be. There is no guideline saying that you should do a VEP, okay? VEP, what we do is a flash VEP. High intensity light is flashed onto the eye and then we hope that there is a uh, some response. It is not necessary at all. PL, NPL. With whatever you see clinically. That is more than sufficient to tell whether you want to do the next step or not. And so, reverse RAPD also. Yeah, it's reverse easy. RAPD, the other right. Yes. You really do not have to do a VEP, subject a patient to a VEP, yes. and then prove that VEP was flat, and hence there was no point in doing the surgery. It is not necessary. It is not at all uh, necessary to prove that the eye is salvageable, not salvageable. You want to do the next step, VR surgery. You do a VR surgery if you believe that there is some chance. That's it. What you have done, you did a surgery, you abandoned. So you have already counseled the patient saying that this is what's going to happen. Fine. VP did not change your uh, decision making still. Yes, sir. So don't force VP, at least in the setting of acute trauma, or even after say five, seven days, patient comes for a second repair. VP is absolutely wa uh, waste. Whether the cornea is black, sorry, uh, coronal blood staining is there with a, a, a hemorrhage behind, even then the VP is useless. So it's not going to guide your uh, treatment at all. Yes. And as a, as again, I'll uh, say no evisceration unless the, there is already auto evisceration there. So it's already auto evisceration. You don't even have to take an evisceration. You're still going to close the eye. No evisceration consent. The only time we do ever do evisceration is when we have this uh, severe infection in trauma, where the globe, sclera, everything is necrosed. 
there's nothing that you can salvage there's no way you can put a tissue back into place yes and uh, for all those uh, people who did uh, pgs in uh, 90s and early 2000 we had a condition called bull gore injury so what happened was after this uh, um, uh, this uh, event called jallikattu the horns of the bulls would uh, would poke into the eyeball so badly that none of the tissues were identifiable so you couldn't really oppose the tears so th that kind of injury where not because uh can you tell me what are the problems if you do not do evisceration doc uh, whoever is presenting what will happen if you do not close it what is one condition which we dread uh, in open globe in injury uh, even if the eye is npl what is it that you will dread uh, years uh, years later none of you mentioned it uh, uh, so far at least sympathetic ophthalmia yes So, so prevent sympathetic ophthalmia to prevent the uveal tissue prolapse and prevent the other good eye. Okay, what is the incidence of sympathetic ophthalmia in trauma? Okay, one of you, please. I don't know. Refresh me, please. Tell, let me know. All of us are doing trauma. We forget all this. Uh, anybody can just refresh later. It's it's okay to not know. At least now we will look for evidence. So, with that in mind, for sympathetic ophthalmia. we will have to repair a wound remove all the uveal tissue even if it is npli and and not really uh, do evisceration just because it's npli uh, does anybody refer here anything to add for this uh, sympathetic ophthalmia i think that's a good uh, point mina yeah thank you thank you Yes, if you plan to do evisceration then you need to have another person saying that yeah, okay you can go ahead with this that is all another person signing say that okay so there is a there is a concurrence between two consultants we are talking about here grievous injury because you are doing a grievous injury you are trying to remove a, uh, an organ out of the body so there you need another person's consent that's all yeah, i think you can there is one more case also Uh, 37 year old uh, uh, male present to uh, presented to us uh, with uh, diminution of vision since 10 months he had uh, injury with a wooden bar uh, about 10 months back uh, locally corneoscleral tear repair was done with uh, lens extraction patient was started on oral and topical steroids and antibiotic medications patient had uh, vision of hand movements with uh, uh, intraocular pressure of 12 mm of mercury uh, anterior segment examination showed a uh, status post corneal tear repair the corneal uh, scar was well sealed it was healed uh, there was aphakia and the posterior segment had a hazy view because of the corneal scar uh, ultrasound b scan showed a, a, more, a high reflective uh, uh, clump echo associated uh, a high reflective uh, clump echo in the vitreous cavity and with back shadowing which is noted in the infero temporal quadrant uh, it was possible i intraocular foreign body with a localized retinal detachment uh, shown on ultrasound b scan a uh, ct scan was done to confirm the intraocular foreign body and it showed a oval shaped uh, uh, metallic foreign body measuring about 3.5 mm and uh, hounsfield units of 3070 uh, a presence of intravitreal hemorrhage and uh, uh, the patient was subsequently taken up for surgery there was no active signs of infection uh, uh, the surgery plan was uh, vitrectomy with the intraocular foreign body removal under guarded visual prognosis uh, patient uh, intraoperatively uh, uh, post uh, when uh, 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 the retina was visualized the intraocular foreign body was noted entangled in the vitreous cavity in the infero temporal quadrant Uh, the intraocular foreign body was freed from all uh, vitreous attachments uh, while sclerotomy was enlarged uh, using mbr a uh, uh, magnet was introduced through the sclerotomy site and intraocular foreign body was brought in the mid vitreous cavity a superior corneal entry was made uh, with keratome and intraocular foreign body was uh, removed through the section on post on post operative day 5 uh, previous slide on post operative day 5 patient had incarcerated retina in the infero temporal quadrant uh, along with uh, 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 peripheral vitreous there is no signs of active infection uh, at 6 weeks of uh, follow up patient presented with low intraocular pressure of 4 mm of mercury and uh, uh, visual acuity remaining the same at hand movements he had total retinal detachment and was subsequently planned for a secondary surgery of endolaser and silicone injection under local anesthesia 
uh, in, in this surgery, intraoperatively, PVR membranes were removed and uh, the inferotemporal in uh, quadrant incarcerated uh, retinal stalk was trimmed from its anterior attachment and the edge of the stalk was cauterized. Postoperative day three, patient was doing well. Uh, the pressures were normal and he's been called for a review after six weeks. Apart, I think, sir uh, has managed. Sir, you want to add anything? Sir? I think uh, one of the indications for early surgery in trauma case is the presence of IFB. But not all IFBs actually end up with an end-off. Any reason why? Uh, some of them are inert, sir. They may be inert and not cause any reaction or infection. So in a setting of a hammer and chisel inj injury, why is there a less chance of end of thermitis? Okay. Yeah. So the impact, impact and the chisel formation, the the temperature at the site of impact is so high that theoretically whatever microorganism would be there, you can assume that they would have been neutralized and the force which it enters through, you probably have a relatively inert, but it may not, it could still be a reactive foreign body, mm. but it's a, a microbiologically and inert foreign body, which is, and that's probably what happened to this mm. patient. Yes. So what echoes were seen on ultrasound were the echoes of the vitreous hemorrhage. Obviously you need to differentiate an echo of a vitreous hemorrhage versus an echo of a and of thalmitis. That's very important. So any any clues from how would you differentiate between the two? Because I think the trauma management and subsequent is not really the scope of the treat, the discussion now. What we are really looking at is how would you approach this patient in terms of your decision making of surgery. So how would you differentiate between the echoes on an ultrasound, differentiating a hemorrhage from a End of thermitis. Mm. Senior residents, you have been doing the ultrasound. Anybody? I don't, are there any senior residents? I don't see no, anyone. Part, the part is on the stage. No, the question was asked how do you, on ultrasound, how you differentiate which is hemorrhage from an end of thermitis? So end of thermitis echoes will be more, much more of a membrane, uh, membranous echoes along with clump like. Uh, Thing. Mobility will be good in cases of vitreous uh, hemorrhage echoes. So vitreous hemorrhage at the start, you may not actually see much of echoes. Mm -hmm. It's only when it clumps Organize, together organized. that you start getting the hyperreflective echoes. Yes, Hemorrhages might be in layers. Mm -hmm. End of thalmitis tends to be more aggregated, more inferiorly. Mm -hmm. There could be secondary signs. If you have choroidal thickening, it's more in favor of a inflammation that's happening. Mm -hmm as against a foreign body. Again, when the foreign body, you could also have vitreous, which is pulled along, mm. which tracks along with the foreign body at the impact site, especially if it's uh, incarcerated in the retina. So you will have those. And obviously you have the clinical setting of an end of thermitis where the eye is much more inflamed and you have the, but if you're just looking at this picture, because there is no choroidal thickening and uh, whatever echoes you see as more related to the uh, site of the perforation okay. itself and there is no diffuse kind of heme so uh, or diffuse kind of echoes you would still think that this is more of a sterile setting more likely to be a hemorrhage yeah. as compared to be a end of thalmitis yes. this is also important because you need to decide where you're going to take up this case for surgery would you do it in a clean case would you do it in the mot would you do it as the first case or the last case? Because all these are important. You don't want to take this up as a first case in the MOT if you have a doubt in, in, in your clean OT. Because all your subsequent OT is not just that. We also have AHUs which are shared with other operation theaters. So you have a potential risk of the infection in the other theaters also if you, this is an end of case. So as a senior resident looking at uh, emergency cases, these are the things that you need to answer for such case. Yes. So the history, the setting of the trauma, the uh, potential uh, composition of the foreign body, all will help you in making the decision whether you would like to wait for the uh, inflammation to sub down versus going in 
very early despite the inflammation because you also have a potential risk of endophthalmitis that you could so ifb as a thumb rule definitely early surgical intervention is the rule for these patients yes so i think it's an emergency isn't it intraocular foreign body is an emergency emergency yes uh, one more question i wanted to ask you sir about the corneal wound does corneal wound uh, give you any uh, uh, a hint as to whether the foreign body has uh, caused end of thalmitis can you please show the uh, so, sorry i'm asking you to show the anterior segment photograph there is no photograph here sorry no, we don't have a photograph no. you don't have a photograph suppose you had a, a jagged wound not well sutured then i suppose you would assume it would mm -hmm. have caused infection or even an a very eye which is i really very quiet i suppose both both scenarios exist isn't it yeah yeah but generally a larger wound especially as you said a jagged wound okay. is more likely to be uh, a stone kind of setting or in case of a road traffic accident you're likely it could be contaminated with uh, basically the circumstance of injury suppose it's a road traffic accident you will find yeah. more chance that's a nice point sir thanks the nature of the injury is very important to suspect a foreign body so you have to exactly go to the history ask the patient exactly what hit the eye how did the injury happen that will give a good clue good clue whether to suspect or there is a foreign body or not. so intraocular foreign body one consensus is that the uh, the delay in intraocular foreign body increases the risk of end of thalmitis since an early surgery is recommended in less than 48 hours uh, second consensus uh, states that uh, the, you should have a primary wound from wound closure and systemic antibiotic followed by delayed removal it is hypothesized that uh, the delay in iofb removal uh, uh, may help in cases which uh, have corneal edema severe inflammation and intact posterior hyoid and if ergonomically or uh, if the patient is systemically unstable the studies in literature that have shown that delayed iofb removal with a combination of systemic and uh, and uh, topical antibiotic coverage can result in relatively good visual outcome uh, this study had a mean iofb removal period of 38 uh, days and the range from 2 days to 660 days a study done by ostas at uh, all showed that uh, the the more the weight and the size of the posterior segment of uh, intra uh, iofb injury it was associated with worse outcomes visually and anatomically and uh, they did not find any difference between the early or late uh, vitrectomy done in these eyes uh, coming on to uh, controversies regarding uh, the management of open globe injuries with respect to the vr department uh, with respect to the timing of vitro uh, vitrectomy surgery whether a prophylactic cryopexy around sutured wounds in cases of scleral uh, laceration should be done or not a prophylactic scleral buckle or a belt buckle in an uncomplicated vitrectomy with no identifiable retinal damage uh, prophylactic antibiotics and the routes of administration and whether you need to place uh, intraocular lens if possible so we come to the end of the discussion and uh, the talk take home message that uh, we would like to share that we have to rule out any life threatening damage before uh, approaching a person for with open globe injury good documentation and careful examination is must we have to look for signs of end of thalmitis history of intraocular foreign body occult tear or rupture to be taken as a primary management by vr surgeon primary wound closure should be done within 24 hours close follow up of the patient is also uh, advised because uh, of the development of secondary sequelae later like angle recession retinal detachment and traumatic iritis we should promote public awareness of home or recreational ocular trauma and use of protective eyewear uh, i most probably with uh, polycarbonate glasses uh, which comes under primary pre uh, prevention Uh, the emergency team the consultants and sr and fellows we would like to thank all of you for helping us through this journey and uh, for uh, uh, putting your useful inputs uh, i think we should thank the emergency team who could provide so much of photos and the documented uh, evidences to collect these cases in very time and uh, i thank all the consultants i think uh, they have managed it so elegantly and hope i think any questions are there from again sir and i thank all the online joiners who have spent their 2 hours time with us to enlighten lot of uh, important information as far as the open globe injuries are concerned thank you one and all thank you both of you thank you sir for thank guiding you, us thank you